Hi, my name is Michael Chikin. The smartest people I've met have one common belief, that us silly humans really don't know much. For example, we still don't know why planes stay in the air, or how Tylenol or even gravity works. Yeah, gravity. Look it up. <laughs> in today's distracted, clickbait, misinformation age, I wish we could all be less certain, more humble, and a lot more curious. Admittedly, I've been known to struggle with all three. So no more, no less, this show is my attempt to be that change. Thanks for joining me, and here we go. Hey everybody, welcome back to No More, No Less. I'm your host, Michael Chikin, and today in studio, I'm excited to have Teresa Schechter with me. Teresa is an award-winning award women, filmmaker, public speaker, and the founder of the production company, Trixie Films. Her work fuses humor, activism, and personal storytelling to explore and confront what's considered most sacred about womanhood. Teresa began her two decades long film career at the Robert De Niro's production company, Tribeca Productions. Since then, her work has been screened and streamed globally on TV and home video, at the Brooklyn Museum and at the Kinsey Institute and at film festivals from Rio de Janeiro to Istanbul to Seoul. Her work is in the collections of hundreds of universities, nonprofits, and libraries, and has been featured in the Atlantic, New York Magazine, Vice, NPR, the Chicago Tribune, the New York Post, Elle, The Guardian, and many more. Today, we're going to talk about her new film called My So-Called Selfish Life, which explores women who have made the choice not to have children and the growing child-free movement. So, Teresa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I watched the show over the last, sorry, the documentary over the last couple of days, and I, I really, really loved it. Explored so many different points of view over something that people really don't want to talk about. It, it <laughs> seems, and the one that do do it uh, anonymous, uh, anonymously on Facebook or Reddit or to you, <laughs> and and I guess so. One one of the questions I had is that in the documentary. Uh, you you know you interviewed your adorable mother a couple times who you know by the end had way more to to say than than I had expected from her own journey, um, and you said you knew from quite a young age that you didn't want to have children that it was something that was within you and you you know you knew, so I was wondering throughout your you know successful documentary career what what was it with the timing that it felt like this was the time to tell this story opposed to something that you know had been with you all along. Um, that's a really good question. I think that it's something I've been thinking about my whole life and in one way or another, but never really was prepared to talk about because there's a lot of right. judgment and stigma and pushback. And for a long time through my 20s and 30s, I assumed I'd have children anyway, like even though I knew I didn't want them. I right. just assumed I would because it's, you know, it's what people do and I would meet a man who wanted a family and, um, you know, all of the very, I think they're very typical things that happen to people through, through their lives. And I just thought, well, I'm just going to have to do it eventually. So I'll just do whatever I can to live my full life until then, until my life ends, <laughs> basically by getting married and having children. This was my, my feelings in my twenties and thirties. I've, I've come uh, a long way since then. Um, but it, so it was something I really didn't talk about. And then um, as I got a little older, I met a lot more people who felt the way I did. And I think that the real triggering thing was an article that um, my, my very good friend, uh, Ann Kingston, wrote for McLean's Magazine. And that's something that we talk about in the film. And she did a cover story on this growing uh, movement of people who don't want children. That came out in 2009. Um, and she got so much hate mail for it. We were both sort of stunned. And right. the, the we, first one, though, right? Because I think the second article she did following up was more accepted. Is that my guess? Yes. Right? The, the, okay. the second article was on something I think was much more controversial, which right. was people who regret uh, becoming mothers. However, you know, times evolve. And by the time that came out in the mid 2010s, um, she got a lot of positive feedback for it. People were really glad she was talking about it. Um, she got positive feedback on the on the cover story about um, people who don't want children. 
but the level of vitriol that accompanied it from other people was staggering. And I, I remember thinking, like, why are people so bent out of shape about something that really has nothing to do with them? Like, it's really somebody else's decision, yeah. and it's not it, it's it's not for them to worry about. Don't worry about it. Um, so that started it. That's and and Anne was was relentlessly um, bugging me to make this film because um, I had made other films about you know women's experiences with feminism, with with sexuality, um, and this seemed like a good going into motherhood seemed like a good one. Um, and and the other thing that was happening parallel to to that was that there was a lot more conversation with the rise of social media. A lot of groups were forming on social media talking about this where people could share their own experiences but also find other people and find kinship and realize that, um, excuse me for that very loud noise, where people could find kinship in um, knowing they weren't alone in this. All these things kind of converged at a certain time. When I made my last film about virginity, it was really in the middle of the abstinence until marriage programs uh, at, in full force in the U.S. And it seemed like, well, this is the time to talk about that. Right. And this was the time to talk about um, this idea of being child-free. So it's, it's always sort of a convergence of things that happen, and you feel like this is entering the zeitgeist now. And right. this, is, this is a good time. People are engaged with this, paying attention, and they want to – talk more about it right. so i started working on the film in like about 2016 i would say gotcha sorry give me one second to put this blind down i feel like uh i'm just like pastor in front of the goats oh, i felt like i looked like casper the friendly ghost uh, uh, <laughs> with the sun coming in um what i was going to say is it's really interesting how you're right only two or three years later when Anne published that article on regretting uh, motherhood w w have you thought about doing a follow-up to your um, documentary uh, and seeing like if you can have the same res response on regretting motherhood you know we touch on it in the film mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the people one of our you know experts is the sociologist dr. Orna Donath who wrote a book called Regretting Motherhood. She did a really groundbreaking study talking to women about um, why they had children and why they regretted having those children. And, right. um, and somebody is actually doing a film about that topic now. I think in Sweden, I'm not sure. But That's there is a great. film in the works on that, on that topic. So I think that I would let someone take all of their energy and, and, and work on it. And I know that they're also, I believe, speaking to, to Dr. Donath also. So um, I think I'm going to let that go and let somebody else take the ball and run with it and, and push the conversation further because it's a, it's a topic that really needs more examination. And it is becoming something that people talk about more and more. Um, which is sort of this massive taboo that um, seemed like it would never be be talked about. And, right, so. and again, because the reason I, I asked that is there's one um, part I really enjoyed in the film. I think you said, I don't care if everyone has kids. I just want all the women to know that they don't have to have them if they don't want to, um, and that the option to abstain is available to them. Because a, a theme that I found through a lot of my interviews, and this is something I've felt very strongly about my whole life, is that I don't like people being forced to do things that they don't want to do uh, and feel like they need to take a path in which they feel deep within them that they don't want to. And like, luckily for people like you and a lot of people in your film, you're able to really attach yourself to that feeling that you don't want to have kids and therefore make that decision. But there are man if if i you know if i had a nickel for every you know girl i knew and you know growing up in university or wherever who said they didn't want a kids and now have kids like you know there'd be a lot of nickels <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 so i i think seeing your film there is a lot of like counterculture sort of people um characters throughout who it seems like they they were already outside of what people would consider typical society. 
So I think maybe making the decision for them was then already easier because they didn't feel that they were inside of this, you know, patriarchal bubble that just wants them to, to breed. And that's like well-intentioned people, but also this mechanism of more babies, more babies, you know, this pronatalism culture. And, and so was there anything really surprising that you learned going through this process? Cause like, I'm sure the story changed and the, and the, and the themes and, and as, as you went through it, and is there anything that, that popped up that you didn't expect when you started out? You know, I, I'd be happy to talk about that, but before I do, I want to push back a little bit at sure. the idea that, that ev- the people in my film are countercultural. Um, I don't, I don't think they are. I mean, some of them may, may be, um, you know, working in more creative fields, for example. Um, I, but I don't, I don't think there's, they're particularly countercultural. Um, I think that there is sort of a cross section of, you know, one of the women in my film works in finance. <laughs> there's nothing countercultural and right, like sure. scuba diving, you know, and, um, you know, another is a, is a, respected journalist. Um, so I think some people may be different than some people may meet on a day to day basis. Um, but I, I don't think they're, I think they are the culture. They are part of the culture. And if people haven't met people like them before, it's because they're not getting out enough, honestly. (laughs) So (laughs) yeah, that um, that, that is an interesting point because even like the, the people in my life that I, that I know that have chosen not to have, not to have children, what I mean, kind of culture perhaps was the wrong phrasing that I meant. Um, because even in my experience, they're outside of the, the system themselves. People I know that are maybe like digital nomad entrepreneurs that aren't inside of the nine to five sort of sort of thing and because I, I remember th- just thinking about it while I was watching your film thinking like, w- like what would what is the barrier between us getting more women to have these reflections before they have children because you even said it or I can't, can't believe someone said it in your film that there's more thought that goes into not having children than having children which is like you think it would be the other way around so w- maybe to Instead of that other question I asked, what do you think is is stopping more people from being able to reflect on this, um, you know, self awarely to know if they want to make that leap? I I think that the you have to start by acknowledging that we live in a culture that is um, deeply deeply pronatalist, and what I mean by that word is that there is constant um, pressure, uh, encouragement, coercion. <laughs> Uh, to have children, that we are raised understanding that the normal thing to do is to have children, and what gives women value in the world is to have children, and the greatest joy and love they will ever experience is to have children. Um, And people who feel like maybe that's not the life they want to live are pushed in many ways outside of quote-unquote normal society. So what, like I said, when I grew up, I didn't know anyone who didn't have children except for um, a handful of couples that people felt really sorry for. It was, we never discussed why they might not have children. Did they want kids? And, you know, there were issues around infertility or one of the you know, many reasons people cannot have children when they want to. Or did they genuinely just feel happy and content with their life as it was and um, didn't feel like they wanted or needed to expand their family beyond the two of them. Um, So we don't see it. Not only do we not see it, but when we do see it, it's shown as something really negative. Um, Pop culture is full of stereotypes of, you know, bitter, bitchy, childless women or desperate, neurotic, childless women. it's, it's really hard to find role models in popular culture that um, are very clear about the fact that they're not interested in having children who are um, celebrated, beloved main characters. <laughs> there, there's just very few of them. And if that happens, um, some writer's room ends up knocking them up anyway. 
uh, because they they fully believe that that is really the happy ending they should have. And Big Bang Theory, I don't know if anyone watches that show, but Big Bang Theory is um, a great example of two very outspoken main characters who did not want children. And by the time the series ended, um, yeah. one had one had more than one child at that point, and the other discovered she was pregnant. And there was no conversation about that. She just was pregnant and was like, oh, well, I'm pregnant. After an entire season of her telling her partner that she did not want to have children. Like the whole, the whole season was about that. So I guess what I'm saying is if you don't see something, you don't, it's much harder to imagine that it's possible. And we grow up in a world which is um, very, very um, pronatalist and very much reflects those ideas in our society. And that comes from our families. It comes from our culture. It comes from our uh, religious traditions. It comes from cultural traditions. It comes from government policy, all the way up and down the line. Um, in the film, I do spend a lot of time showing specific examples of this. Um, why you never or rarely will see a pregnancy test ad where someone is happy not to be pregnant. I defy you <laughs> to find right. more than like one ad where somebody is looking, it's all very classic, the nice music is playing, someone's sitting on their beautiful couch waiting for the pregnancy test result to come through. Right. And you never see <laughs> negative, I'm so happy it's negative right. they, and they you know high five they, their partner they high five they hug they call their you know mother and go mom I'm not pregnant <laughs> isn't that great news you know and and that's that's <laughs> it doesn't happen it just doesn't happen and you have to ask yourself why why when I believe that many many people take pregnancy tests to determine that they are not pregnant we never see that reflected in these commercials. They are always, always everybody happy and crying um, because they got a positive result on their test instead of just going, whew, that was a close call. So right. <laughs> that's just one example. But well, when you start looking for it, it's everywhere. No, I think you're totally right. Like even with the, with the handful of emails you and I exchanged and we were talking about that we're both equal Marvel fans, and I thought about that movie that you, you haven't seen yet, the uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse movie, where the most one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe is Scarlet Witch. And that entire movie is her trying to jump through different dimensions in the multiverse so she can steal her children from another version of herself. Like, I didn't even really think about the plot line so much until our conversation, and I was like, that is really messed up that 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 this is what the most one of the most powerful Marvel characters is what they're making her do that that she will try to ruin the universe because she hasn't had children like it is everywhere in media and like you said until you kind of enter the matrix or take off these <laughs> pronatalist yeah. glasses you really can't see how insidious it is it's, it's really insidious. And, and that's not to say that there aren't people, many people who really want children mm -hmm. very much. And it is um, a, a real, really sad thing that, that they're not able to have them um, or that they have to go through all sorts of intense fertility um, programs to conceive. Um, this is a thing people there are people who really very much want children and it, it is tragic for them that that that's not happening i guess what i'm saying is that's not everyone <laughs> you know there's this generalization and i think sometimes it's you know when we look at what's being sold to us and how things are being reflected back to us how we see ourselves in the world um it's not just who we want to be, but it's how um, larger powers want us to be. So we're being shown role models that espouse a certain set of values. Um, we're, being, we're being told that this is who you should be, this is who you want to be, this is what's normal, when in fact following like one only one life path 
is not is not healthy. It's not the way to, to live a full life, being set on one path and not being able to even consider whether there might be another path that would make us happier or would, would make the world a better place for that matter. So um, I'm, I'm uh, a big uh, booster of people who, who really want children and have thought about it and mm. um, know what they're in for. And <laughs> many friends and family are in that um, uh, group. But I really think that we need to be able to see more kinds of lives and more kinds of people and be given a chance to sit for even five minutes to think about what might make us happy as opposed to what we're told will make us happy. Right. Yeah, because it's actually, actually after speaking with a uh, mutual friend, Andita, at, at Population Balance, um, they, her and her, um, one of the researchers and co, um, co-podcaster, Alan, uh, they were making a really strong point that everyone thinks that this is inherent and biological with within us and they are combating that being like well no since you know time immemorial there have been ways that women have been trying to not have children to um, manage their fertility uh, and be it through you know scientifical or mystical ways whether they worked or not through timing and herbs and all of these things so like there's, there's ample evidence to say that many women have always thought of like, well, I don't, I don't want to have children or one in 10 of the women I know are dying because, you know, doctors don't wash their hands during the birthing process in the, you know, the 1800s. And so that really kind of put a, a stick in the spoke of my wheel that thought that this might be just humans being humans. Whereas the funny part is the more I'm thinking about it and maybe I think we just get bored. <laughs> people, people are in, <laughs> in relationships or, or in these little conclaves of their, of their family and they don't know what to talk about. So the grand, the, the grandparents say, are you going to have a kid? Are you going to have a kid? And then they're, the couple is like, well, are we going to have a kid? <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then the lack of a decision ends up being a decision. Like I, I know again, many examples now of people that had second and third and fourth kids because they just decided to, well, if it happens, it, it happens. And of course it, it always happens. I, I really don't know any couple that said, we'll just see what happens. And then they don't use protection and then they don't have a baby. So yeah. I think this is maybe Basic. just the, the laziness of humans <laughs> that we, that we don't take enough forethought. I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, um, you know, it is, it is interesting that, um, you know, people, people bring new humans into the world without much thought um, because it's what we're supposed to do or, you know, what others are expecting us to do. Yeah, right. um, exactly. Big question marks on that. Um, again, bringing a new human into the world is a profound thing that should not be taken lightly. Uh, and uh, knowing that you will have to care for and raise and educate and feed and clean this new human for years and support it through this new human's entire life as long as you're around to do it. Right. Um, it seems like something I would want to give some serious thought to. Um, but also at, at the same time, you know, when you look at um, what what pregnancy, birth, and raising a child means in women's lives. We're talking about mental health, physical health. Um, we're talking about um, whatever plans and ambitions this person has. A lot of it is going to have to be set aside because they're expected to be the primary caregiver. Usually, right. you, we saw during um, during the pandemic how many women left the workforce because they had to now become, you know, homeschoolers and care for their kids. And um, they were the default parent who was going to take one for the team. Um, the, the amount of thwarted uh, goals and dreams and ambitions that this produces is, I think, kind of heartbreaking. Hmm. There are a lot of things that will affect women when they have children. The maternal mortality rate in the United States is shockingly high. It's the highest in the developed world. Didn't know that. Yeah, and especially, especially for Black women, 
it's shockingly high. It's 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 a an embarrassment <laughs> that the U.S. cannot protect women. And now with with um, Roe v. Wade being overturned, it's even worse, um, putting women at incredible risk, uh, whether they have an unplanned and un unwanted pregnancy, but also if they've miscarried, um, or if they are carrying a wanted child and there is some fetal anomaly that happens. Um, the level of care that is now available to women in this country is disgustingly low. Um, because of this. And I think that all roads lead back to pronatalism. You know, this idea that having babies is the most important thing a woman is going to do. And this idea of the self-sacrifice of the mother, you know, it's always the fetus seems to have more legal rights than the actual human, alive, living, grown up human. Right. So, yeah, so it's, it's also, it's also insane to me. Like even in, in the U.S. that because the pronatalism in the U.S. seems also linked, firstly to religion, Christianity it seems, and and capitalism, where to think that if there's a uh, a reduction in population, that the 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 country is just going to completely fold and and die immediately, and there's this like fevered panic over anything of stagnant growth, as like growth or growth or death seems to be the the anthem. And of course, the you know these white Christian nationalists also think that they need more white babies to fulfill the whatever dreams that they may that they that they may have. And so, it is really terrifying to see what's happening in the U.S. And I hope there's some ability to do a U-turn on some of this legislation because even if you're just following like some European rule where it's completely legal and after four months, then it's more on a on a medical basis like there's a lot more to be said where these like first you know uh old testament sort of policies that are going up in the u.s where i think i think it was south carolina that wanted to put a bill forth to make it uh the death penalty for anybody that uh, that, that gets an abortion so that's why i think a movie like yours is really so important and and timely right now just for people to understand that like there is a world that does exist where you don't have to to have a children a child you can you can really make a decision for for yourself uh, yeah and beyond that too i think um you know parents who choose to have one child the one and dones yeah. um are under excruciating pressure as well um to have more children hmm. um couples who want children are under excruciating pressure to have children when other people want them to not when they feel ready to um, this goes on down the line. What is it? It's turtles all the way down. It's like it's pronatalism all the way down, right. um, whether it's conscious and government mandated or whether it's just families doing what their cultural or religious um, dictates, you know, tell them to. So um, I think it's I think it's all over. And I will say also, as, as bad as the U.S. is right now with um, access to reproductive health care. Um, there are other countries that are even worse. Um, Hungary, Poland, Russia, um, just to name a few, have terrifying uh, reproductive policies right now in order to build the native uh, uh, population, by which I mean not immigrants. It's right. the same in the U.S. too. We don't want to let any more immigrants in. We want to grow the population with our native, whatever that means in the U.S., which is this incredible, like, diverse place. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's, it kills people, <laughs> you know, and it ruins people's lives. And this is all so the government can get more, you know, the Hungarian government needs more Hungarians, you know. And, and, and when the incentives don't work, when, you know, paying people for having more children or giving mothers medals for having six or more children, when that doesn't work, because it generally doesn't work, <laughs> um, then you start punishing people for not having children. You start punishing them by raising their taxes, which happens in, in some countries, and there are calls for it here and in the UK. Um, you punish them by uh, basically getting rid of all access to reproductive um, health care. 
um, all access to contraception, abortion, um, uh, Romania in the 80s under Nicolae Ceausescu, for example, if anyone wants to look that up, um, a huge number of women died from illegal abortions because they weren't available. And many, many, many children were born who were not planned or wanted and many ended up in orphanages. And the Romanian orphanages are notorious for what um, horrible experiences they were for the kids that grew up there and even in adulthood now. So this is all real, like this is happening right around us. And this is all pronatalism. This is this idea of reproductive control, um, state mandated, for reasons that really have nothing to do with the well-being of their citizens and everything to do with their greater um, sort of vision of what the country should be. I mean, this is all this is all pretty dark stuff, you know. It's yeah. it's it's hard. It's rough stuff to talk about, um, you know. And I make films about things that make people uncomfortable to talk about that are sometimes really rough, and I do them as. Um, pretty humorous films because I think that it's easier to become engaged in this stuff when you're also being entertained in one way or another. And so I'm very committed to, to keeping humor in, in my films in order to, I don't know, facilitate these conversations in a right. way that, that sort of this very dark, depressing kind of reality and conversation is, I think, I, it makes me feel hopeless, so it's not, you know, I'm sure other people feel that way too. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Your because your film definitely had a lightness to it. Like even when you when you tackled more serious issues, which I actually want to discuss in a sec, I, I don't remember ever thinking that this was like a bleak topic. Like everyone had a you know maybe a joke here and there, or even someone that was uh, like there, there was one university student who she she went on a bit of a journey find someone that would that would sterilize her because she was yeah. so so young and even that it, it's quite a quite a serious decision and topic for someone so young but like you could, there was a definitely lightness in in the film which i guess a testament to the tone that you wanted to to set but with with that said something in the film and something you mentioned earlier about the black community and their and their point of view is something I really, no surprise, hadn't thought of uh, from this from this perspective on this topic, and all the experiments that have been done, even as late as I think 2020, by uh, by ICE that were that were sterilizing uh, African Americans in uh, in the U.S. I, I don't know if they were also doing it to Latinos or anyone else in their in their capture, but definitely to uh, African Americans. And then the second part of that story is our. Because there, I think there's two or three black women in your in your film who have chosen not to have children, and the pushback they are getting from from their community was really shocking to me. That they're being told you're doing the white man's work, like they don't want us to have more kids, and you're and you're helping them. Like that's that's a real dark way to approach someone's decision not to have a have a, have a child. Um, is, can you shed any more light on that topic? Because like, I found it really interesting and something I, I never would have thought of, obviously. I think that any community that has been a victim of genocide, which I think black Americans have definitely been uh, historically, um, wants to grow that community again. They want to grow their population. Um, so it comes from a place where... Um, so many people were killed and um, wanting to, to just build up the community again. Um, however, that doesn't mean that, you know, as, as, as one of the women in the film says, this is Dr. Kimia Dennis, who's a university professor, you know, she says, don't, don't question my African identity. You know, don't, don't question, mm -hmm. you know, don't question how I, how I, approach my uh, my race and my history. Me not wanting to have children does not mean that I'm not supporting my community. But that is something that people hear. And it, it isn't just in black in black communities, for example. Really any any group of people who have experienced any kind of genocide are going to put a premium on um, 
regrowing the population. Um, so I get it. But I think that the interesting thing is, I, I feel like for a long time, the child-free space, like online, for example, was a very white space. And uh, the stories that were being told were very uh, white stories, which, which are good stories, but you know, it's only part of the picture. Right. And um, I was, uh, I felt like it was incredibly important to get, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a variety of voices. And if you don't have black women talking about their own choices, whether or not to have children, you miss a big part of this story and this conversation. So I was really glad that there were people in the film who could talk, speak to that. Uh, another person in the film, Dr. Kristen Brandy, who's so brilliant, um, OBGYN, um, she, uh, you know, her family's Puerto Rican and she could speak to, <clears throat> sorry listeners, I'm losing my voice. She she could speak to the um, the testing of birth control pills that was done on Puerto Rican women before it was uh, right. approved for U.S. use. Um, the um, for sterilization of, of of women of color that had been going on for since the early 20th century, right into actually. Um, there was a film that came out recently called The Belly of the Beast, which was about uh, incarcerated uh, women in California who were being um, sterilized, sometimes without their consent or knowledge. Wow. Um, and, you know, the prison populations are largely people of color. And uh, the doctors were making jokes like, well, it's cheaper than welfare. You know things like that so it's really really like deep <laughs> deep-seated racism and um, misogyny that's a, that's at work in all of these things and some of we do talk about that in the film we talk about eugenics we talk about um, reproductive oppression that pronatalism isn't just um, isn't just uh, trying to get people to have children it's trying to get the right people to have children right. which is an important distinction I think the right people to have children yeah um, I, i'd say so I, I was wondering because you, your 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 background is jewish is that right mm -hmm, yes and so i, I want to explore uh, something for a moment because you you said a, a lot of um culture is a culture of people that went through a certain amount of genocide want to regrow the population and i was hoping maybe you could speak to the jewish perspective on this because I, only recently i can't remember what show i was watching but it was this israeli woman talking about how um, in the Jewish faith, life begins at first breath, opposed to this idea that the fetus is a, its separate entity, uh, and also that um, abortions in Israel are all uh, government paid for. And so I, I was wondering, like, it, but with those things in mind, is there still in the culture that, you know, every Jewish couple should have at least two or three children to try to keep things going well um i'm not a talmudic scholar <clears throat> so i can't speak to the exact scripture on this and also i i don't know enough about the israeli reproductive um uh technology israeli reproductive policy no to i just give you more a, like in, in the a learned in the, answer on that yeah like more like in the, cu in the <clears throat> culture is there an, an idea that if you're gonna have kids you should have as many as you can well you know, it depends, um, you know, Judaism um, has different uh, sort of levels of faith and observance. So if you are uh, ultra-Orthodox, for example, um, in those families, they are encouraged to have as many children as possible, um, as many children as possible. And, and the, the thinking behind it, given sort of to, to the communities, is that, you know, the six million who were slaughtered, who were murdered during World War II, um, we need to rebuild the community just so, just as uh, other um, victims of genocide. Um, right. I think that that feeling is is throughout um, the Jewish community. I would say I certainly heard it growing up that we needed to have kids and raise Jewish kids uh, because of this uh, astonishingly large. Uh, loss of humanity. Um, I think that if you're not in a very orthodox uh, environment, 
um, people aren't going to be pushing you to have like 10 kids. That's not gonna, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's sure. more like you should have a couple of kids, you know, and, and that, that would be great. Um, uh, but no, I, I, nobody ever told me I needed to have like, you know, a lot of kids, but you know, my sister has two kids and, um, I, I, not because she's trying to, you know, rebuild the community, but because she wanted to have children, <laughs> she and her husband wanted children and, um, and, uh, they do, uh, my nephews are awesome. Um, <laughs> And they're, they're being raised as, as Jews. You know, my sister and her husband are Jewish. And um, that's all really, again, really important. Um, so it's a message that, that we do get. My husband got that message from his mother a lot, that he mm. needed to get married and have children. Right. Um, my, I never got it from my family, uh, which is interesting. Uh, my my parents are are Holocaust survivors. Um, they were in Europe during World War II. Um, the fact that they survived was a, a fluke of, of timing and geography, honestly. Um, but they never but they never said that. They never asked that of us. So you know, it varies. But yes, it's a thing. It's definitely a thing. And, and in Israel too, I think that there's a, there's a push for people to have um, several children, um, and, uh, that there, there, there are like reproductive services, but at the same time, abortion is also available. So it's, it's not, you know, they're, they're not using Hungarian techniques, let's say, yeah. to grow the population. Right. Yeah. Cause there's so many nuanced points to be made on this on this topic. I think people are a lot of people are, are really scared to hold two ideas in their head at the same time. I, I can't remember who said the quote in your film, but it was like, uh, "I love my children, but I hate being their mother." Mm -hmm. And I, I think you could probably have a, a, a an hour documentary on that topic and, ex and exploring what that means, because like even I, I do have a, a couple friends, women who have confided in me that like, of course they love their kids. But if they could have the choice to go back, they don't know that they would either firstly do it again or secondly have the same amount of, of children um, because uh, most people don't have any perspective on what motherhood or parenthood is like alongside you know, the, the marriage. Ho you know, hopefully it's going well or not. Um, it's funny because I, I, I was the only child until I was 15 until my brother came along. And I, I remember just how much – I, I love that kid like he was m he was my own kid, and I remember how much fear I I felt and sometimes still feel thinking if something bad were to happen to him, and the idea of that, like perpetuating through my life if I had kids, really all always stayed with me. And I said that I'm in my early 40s now, and I've always thought like if it were to happen, meet the right person, and if it's what felt right for us, then I'm I would be open to it. But I don't want to shoehorn a child into my life if it doesn't feel like it would be something that's right for me. And a few years ago, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine who was thinking about, you know, having children. I think she, she was infertile. They were thinking about adopting and all of these things. And I told her about this fear that I realized I had even when I was younger and thinking about my, my younger brother and, you know, if anything in the world might, you know, become him. And... And she only told me years later that she thought that this fear idea I had was really odd, but she didn't want to tell me that. But fast forward to now that they had a surrogate and they have a, their own child, she's like, oh, my God, Mike, the fear. <laughs> she's like, now I get like every day I think about this. And I think it would probably be 10 times the fear I had for my brother when I have my own – if I had my own child. So these are perspectives that I think are impossible to, to have, but maybe the Internet – can now finally maybe do something helpful by giving women that have these thoughts some community online and they can ask another mother like, well, what about this? What about that? So you can get a full perspective of what your life might be like and then you can do your best to make that decision. Like, is that what you, what you saw with some of the people you interviewed? Well, I, I think that it's 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 good to know that there are other people who have these feelings that you have that you mm -hmm. don't think you're allowed to have 
that's always really important. Um, but I, I do think that our, our culture is so overwhelming that <clears throat> I think that, you know, parents don't want to admit that it's hard. They don't want to admit that they regret having done it. Um, because we live in such a black and white society. So for me to say, I don't want children and I would like uh, to talk about this and um, possibly validate other people's feelings around this. Basically the knee jerk thing is <laughs> you hate children. <laughs> you right. are a horrible person. Um, you must have had a terrible childhood yourself. You are without love. I mean, all of, all of these things, if you've listened to Fox News, <laughs> Tucker Carlson responding to Chelsea Handler's videos about not wanting children, it's really amazing. Like, you know, we're, we're bitter, horrible people um, who should not reproduce because the world doesn't want our, our children anyway because we're so horrible. I mean, all of this stuff, it's like, you just have to sit and laugh. It's like, two things can be true at once. <laughs> You yeah. know, uh, the world is a spectrum of gray. It is, it is very, very rarely black and white. Um, so for all of these things, I think it's really more conversation, but also you need to really, um, you need to identify and explore and confront all of these things. You need to say, hey, this is something that's going on. Can we talk about it? And talk about what it means. Hmm. Can we take a minute of our day and, and think about why we're only seeing pregnancy test commercials where everyone is over the moon thrilled to be pregnant <laughs> when we know, we know that our reality is different than right. that. Especially now when, you know, um, getting an abortion is, is becoming more and more impossible. It has been impossible for a lot of people for a long time, by the way, but right. you know, this is this is real. We know this in our hearts that that we don't. Not every pregnancy is a welcome pregnancy. We all know this, and yet and yet we feel like we have to sort of go along with this idea that 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 it is a, a pregnancy is always a blessing. It's always a joy. We should always greet it with happiness. Um, people who want to terminate pregnancies are evil and 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 bitter and. You know, this kind of thing. It is the 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 tidal wave of pressure on us is so overwhelming. Really, even though we know deep in our hearts that we feel differently, and I think with people who are considering becoming parents, there's there there have been a lot of calls for just sort of these parental readiness sort of um, classes. Like, mm. just let's all sit down and talk about what what it means to carry a child, go through labor, how that will affect your life later, what the responsibilities are for raising happy, healthy children, what the, what the you know, issues are, what makes people unhappy about raising children, even if mm -hmm. they love the children, why that person loves her children but doesn't really want to be their mother and wishes that none of it had happened. Right. We need to talk about these stuff, but, but you know, we don't because then people wouldn't have as many children and that does not serve <laughs> capitalism exactly. and it does not serve nationalism and it does not serve patriarchy and it doesn't serve all of these larger systems. So we have to just keep, keep saying, please let's talk about this and please let's be honest about it. I think that is happening slowly, but um, it's a big world. Yeah. Well, I, I think to even, I think you did a great job even showing us where we've come from on this topic by showing the, the woman, I forget her name, she's a seven-year-old that recently wrote a book, um, I think Confes Confessions of a Child-Free Woman or something like that. Yes. And if you don't mind telling the story about her on 60 Minutes, like I was watching it and I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> Like it's it yeah. seemed like a sketch out of out of Saturday Night Live. It seems so absurd to me that that is a thing that that happened. And maybe tell us like what year it was and like, please tell that story. Yeah, sure. So Marsha Drett Davis uh, just turned eighty, actually, um, and uh, she's a 
she's a really lovely woman who is now uh, an advocate for child-free people. She's written two books. She uh, is very, very uh, visible on social media, talking to people all over the world about their feelings about, um, you know, not, not wanting to have children and the pressure they're going, going through. So back in the 70s, um, she was part of a group called the National Organization of Non-Parents. Um, I think I'm getting that right. I don't know why after working on this film for years, I'm blanking. Um, no, yeah, right. National Organization right. of Non-Parents. Uh, and they had a, a conference. This is like in 1974, I think. So by the way, people have been talking about this. Um, they were talking about it in the 70s. They were talking about it in the 20s. This is not something new. Um, a producer from 60 Minutes asked her to, if she wanted to be on the show, they had heard that she was going to tell her in-laws that she didn't want children, she and her husband, and they wanted to be there to film it because they were doing a show on people who, who didn't want children. What a spectacle. And, um, you know, to quote Marsha, you know, she said, foolishly, I said, yeah. <laughs> and we have footage from the 60 Minutes episode, and it's really painful um, she's, she's trying to express why they don't want children and how they can have a happy life and, and experience love without having children. And, and her in-laws, her husband's parents are just really not having any of it. And, uh, and, and they, the editors of 60 Minutes cut out everything that her husband said. So the segment looked like she was the only person of their couple talking about this. Um, so again, our culture wants us to <laughs> hear a certain story. Right. Um, and, and so, so the segment runs, um, Mike Wallace, uh, one of the legendary hosts of 60 minutes comes on and he'll, he says something like, uh, I hope you'll excuse our perverseness of running this episode right. on mother's day. Right. So, <laughs> So um, it airs, and then the next day, Marsha loses her teaching job. Marsha was a teacher, and she got fired. And she got death threats, and her dog got death threats. And, uh, you know, it's like, it, it, it's sort of hard to wrap your head around, but, I mean, that won't happen today. Like Chelsea Handler makes video after video about how much she enjoys her life without children. And you know, the worst that happens is Tucker Carlson says some kind of stupid shit on his show right. and other Fox idiots come on and say more stupid shit and that's it. And then it's over. Right. So but the fact that she lost her job, like I, I really th thought about that, that moment because I, I watched your movie in, uh, in 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 two parts and I think that that part was around when I had to stop it the first day and I had, so I was really thinking about what sort of mentality the the world or at least the U.S. was like during that time to think that someone who just decides that they don't want to be a mother is such a you know should she should wear a scarlet letter she's so broken and damaged that she shouldn't be a a teacher is is astounding to me that like like people must be really scared for anyone that was deviating from the norm at at that at at that time like because like i feel like you just said we can't even fathom something like that happening and you know unless uh the u.s turns into an a uh, you know theocracy in the next you know michael so it is a theocracy <laughs> oh man it is a theocracy the people who are making our laws are using biblical quotes to justify it. Um, and I will also say, you know, what happened to Marsha was, was really terrible. It kind of derailed her career for a long time. Um, but we don't have to look very far to see what's happening in, in many states in the U.S. right now around um, LGBT uh, issues, what you can teach in the schools, what books the, the um, libraries can, can have in them. Um, we're, we're one step away from book, mass book burnings. Um, the conversations about um, trans affirming care for uh, young people, um, basically, <laughs> basically stating that we need to eliminate transgenderism. Let's, let's think about what that phrase means. 
Uh, there's in, in our film, we have a, a like amazing couple and um, one of the two people in the couple are, um, is a trans man. And um, so, you know, when you think about this, this idea of eliminating transgenderism, like what does that mean? It means eliminating trans people. So this is happening today in the United States of America. It's happening in, in um, the state houses. Um, is happening in Congress. Um, what happened to Marsha is happening today. It may not be around people who don't want children, but it is definitely here and it is definitely um, horrifying. So never underestimate how horrifying our culture could get at any, any particular time because there are people out there who are so scared, terrified, threatened by anything that isn't the yeah. norm in their world, yeah, who isn't exactly like them. Right. Um, well, so, I, I, I've seen that in, in different even business groups that I, I've been part of over the years uh, and some that were perhaps filled more with um, of like U.S. based probably Christian uh, entrepreneurs. And it'd be a big group, but there's, you know, a big faction uh, of these people from, from the U.S. And any time in these groups someone's talking about social issues or, or, or whatever, it normally is a, a Christian man that has the most to say that the he knows all the you know ills of society and then of course the only solution are is more people like like him like I like I've seen this happen over and over and over again and to the fact that I had to leave some of these groups because I'm like what like what am I here for like I, I stand up and say something and then other people don't want to cause a cause a ruckus and then I, I'm kind of the, the the lone voice with a couple likes beside it but so I, I definitely yeah. know. I, I know what you're what you're saying that the there are different things that people are fighting for for now, but uh, you know I, I like to try to have hope um, e even even reading through like reading through some of your like the, the fact that people like the people you interviewed are having these conversations so f fervently mm -hmm. and I think within their own communities and they can and at least in the seventies if you felt this way you couldn't share this message with other women you're kind of on your own and maybe you had a tupperware party and you tried to talk to marcia beside you but she probably wasn't going to have it so then you weren't going to talk about it anymore but it seems like like on on tiktok or on instagram or on reddit and all these forums like i think you could have more of a groundswell for people trying to help each other and even the term you used uh, of people pollution which i thought was amazing amazing um oh that's a mike wallace's term that's not my term oh okay <laughs> that's mike no, wallace because I, I thought that term was great because I, I, th I think there – and I don't even remember the context, to, to be honest. but there, I there, can tell you, yeah. Yeah, please, because I thought it was a great term because I think it's totally valid. <laughs> um, he – in the in this episode that um, Marsha is on, they also profiled the National Organization of Non-Parents and mm. uh, Ellen Peck, whose, whose photo is like right behind me, right there, holding okay. her book, The Baby Trap, which was um, – really important book and that's what got Marsha realizing she didn't actually have kid have to have kids um, so Mike Wallace is describing this group non and um, fairly dismissively and he says they're against people pollution um, and he says that meaning that they were allied with some population groups um, population groups of the 70s are different a little bit than they are now um, mm. But it's his, it's his, um, it's his phrase. Um, right. I don't think people are pollution. <laughs> I think they're humans. Sure. Well, the, the, way, the way I look at it is, is like, if we're talking about overpopulation, then, then I think if people are just creating humans without any intention or, or, or thought behind it, then we just have more and more humans without thinking of the impact on our society on our ecosystem and so like <laughs> i i really i really laughed at it but it definitely struck a chord in me <laughs> you know and and also beyond you know people having children without really sort of intention or thought is one part of it but another part of it is the incredible stigma and judgment you know globally on sure. women who don't produce children or don't produce enough children. Their, their value is completely tied up in how many children they can produce. So there's this constant pressure to have more, more children. Um, this is, we, we see this everywhere. So it's not just because people aren't thinking about it. 
there's a lot of coercion, reproductive coercion. There's um, sometimes limited access to contraception, no access to abortion. Again, half the pregnancies in the U.S. are, are unplanned. So um, wow. it's difficult to terminate a pregnancy, all of, all of these things. And um, so there are a lot of reasons why um, people are having more children than they, than they want, honestly. Um, but the, the population, you know, just by the way, is not declining. <laughs> There's no decline. I mean, the, the population is, continues to grow right. and is projected to grow at an alarming rate. We're not running out of babies. Let me just say that. We are not running out of babies. So there's a lot of alarmism um, on this topic, uh, which is uh, not grounded in, in fact. Right. Yeah, well, I guess on that note, I, I really want to thank you for making this film. And I'm, I'm glad that I, I stumbled upon your film and, and you and we were able to have this chat because like um, – you know the woman in the background. What was her name again? The oh, the Ellen Peck. Show? Like yeah, like Ellen Peck. Peck. I think you're you know you're another woman in a long line of women at, trying to give this additional option to women out there to know that for one they're not alone, and secondly that they that they are able to make this decision if it's something that they feel and it's super important. So I really appreciate you taking the time to to chat with me and bringing this topic into my world. Um, I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here, and um, uh, I hope people can can check out the film. It's available in, in limited places at the moment, but I, I'm sure you will let people know how to find it. But it's just myselfishlife.com is the website. Okay, I was going to ask, because I, I know you said mentioned it's playing in Spain right now on the, uh, I believe it's the, the government-funded uh, channel. It's RT, RTVE Play. It's, RTVE it's Play. streaming on RTVE Play until uh, April 3rd in Spain. Yep. Uh, it is available in Canada on the Documentary Channel and on um, um, Vimeo On Demand, which is rent, streaming rental. Um, and uh, it will be coming out in different countries. And uh, we're doing our New York City premiere in May, live premiere. So anyone Amazing. from New York who's listening. And um, and then we'll be doing a global streaming event um, a little bit later uh, in, in the summer, probably. Um, but I invite everyone to go to myselfishlife.com, uh, where we list everything that's coming up. Uh, and then and how to access it. That's great. Yeah, good good domain as well. MySelfishLife.com. Pretty simple. Yes, um, it is. So really, I think people have the right to choose their lives, to choose the lives that are best for them. And I'm going to keep uh, working on trying to make that a reality for as many people as possible. Amazing. Thanks again for your time and for being here. Thanks, Michael. It was a pleasure. So thanks for listening to No More, No Less. I appreciate the time you spent with me today. So please subscribe and rate the show if you enjoyed it. It'll help me create more amazing content and get that next little bit of validation that I so deeply crave. If you didn't enjoy it, well, that sucks. But to make sure, I think you should listen to my next 10 episodes and then decide. I mean, come on. Rome was not built in a day. I'm just getting warmed up here, guys. So thanks again. See you next time.